Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, editor-at-large at The Hub. I'm honored to be joined by David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly video and podcast series, From Dialogues. David, as listeners and viewers know, is a staff writer at The Atlantic, the author of several books, and a highly coveted guest and commentator on various cable television programs. We're honored to provide him with a platform to share his insights and analysis on key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. Today's episode is being recorded during Jewish, the Jewish High Holidays and in advance of Yom Kippur, which as many viewers and listeners know, is the holiest Jewish holiday of the year. Given the context, I thought it would be a good chance to get David's thoughts on the state of the Jewish tradition around the world and the recent spike in anti-Semitism that we're seeing in Canada, the United States, and elsewhere. David, thanks as always for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's start with your own relationship to the Jewish tradition. How has it evolved? And at this stage in your life, David, what's its place in your identity and worldview? Um, well, I'll start with a personal story. My father's parents uh, emigrated from Poland, the, independ the new independent state of Poland to Canada in 1930. Uh, my father was born in Toronto in 1931. Most of the family on both sides stayed behind. Um, if my father's parents had not moved to Canada in 1930, and he had they'd stayed in Poland and he'd been born there in 1931, he would have been murdered sometime around his 11th or 12th birthday, um, either shot or starved to death or maybe ended up in a camp. Most of his relatives were. Um, that's a remembrance that my parents didn't like to talk much with me, to my sister and me when we were growing up, but it, it blooms larger and larger in the mind. Um, as you age and as time in a, a strange way becomes smaller, the distances between events shrink. I think like many North American Jews, I'm um, committed to the tradition of the community without necessarily being super religiously observant. Um, uh, but I, I do feel uh, that what happens to Jews everywhere profoundly affects me. And I, I think um, like many Jews, I share um, the disdain for uh, and more than disdain for this attempt to draw a distinction between those who say, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm, I'm just anti-Israel. Meaning, I, I'm not against all of you, just half of you. Um, and uh, uh, while I think it is certainly theoretically possible um, uh, to be anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic, outside the lab, those conditions are very hard to reproduce. And um, I think it often happens that people become anti-Zionist because they are anti-Semitic. Um, it's some, I think it's more often that, that anti-Semitism leads to anti-Zionism. It sometimes happens that anti-Zionism leads to anti-Semitism. Um, but um, as a practical matter, um, the, the Jewish community uh, has a cohesion um, and uh, we care about each other, whether th those are Jews who are under attack in a place like Argentina, uh, whether those who are Jews who are under attack and um, as, as Jews have been in, um, behind, in the former Soviet Union or whether Jews are under attack um, in Israel. Um, let's stay on um, the Canadian community for a minute. Um, the community here is, um, you know, less than 400,000, but it's strong and vibrant in cities across the country. It's a source of civic engagement, philanthropy, entrepreneurship, etc. Uh, what do you attribute its success to, David? Yeah. Well, let's start with the good news. Um, I, as you say, it's a, it's a the Canadian Jewish community um, is a very blessed community. Um, uh, it does not suffer the kind of uh, physical insecurity uh, that has beset Jewish communities in, in Europe and in the United Kingdom, um, that you don't have that kind of threat of communal violence, that if you wear um, any kind of distinguishing mark in, in public, you face assault, which is quite often true in the streets of Paris or Brussels or um, uh, London or Northern England. Um, and at the same time, because uh, Canada doesn't have the tradition of lone gunman individual violence, you, it, it, Canadian Jews have not been subject to the kind of murderous attacks that you've seen at, at the synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. So um, Canadian Jews, I think, are very physically secure. Because um, the Canadian Jewish to, migration to Canada is somewhat more recent than the United States, I think it is also uh, a more um, communally conscious group than uh, the equivalent of the United States. I mean, I, I, I'm always struck that you know, the Toronto Jewish community is, is not the largest in North America, but in terms of um, uh, its support for community institutions, its collective involvement in the larger community, and Jewish support for the arts and culture, um, it, it has an impact that can only be compared to the Jewish community of New York, which is much larger and wealthier. 
but there is the, not all the news is good. Maybe we can segue to that. Yeah, I would just say in parentheses for listeners and viewers that a, a major study at the University of Toronto in 2019 described uh, some of the characteristics um, that you've just outlined as Canadian Jewish exceptionalism. Um, and as you say, David, it's a tremendous source of, of strength for our country. Yet, um, as I meant, alluded to earlier, there are various reports, including from Tel Aviv University, B'nai B'rith, and Statistics Canada in, here in Canada, that have found that anti-Semitic incidents are way up around the world in 2021. And Canada is no exception. There were more than 3,000 anti-Jewish crimes recorded last year alone. Yeah. What do you think is behind this sudden spike in anti-Semitism? I, I think, um, I don't live full time in Canada and uh, when I am in Canada, I'm in a part of the country where J Jews are pretty rare. Um, but I think if I were to channel it, the Canadian Jewish opinion would be is, you know, the crimes are not really the problem. Um, that's not the problem. That's not what makes Canadian Jews so um, nervous these days. It, it is a rising level of harassment and suspicion and accusation that is non-criminal. Um, I, I think every uh, Canadian Jew would compare that, for example, if you're a Canadian Jew of my age and attended college in the 1980s, you found campuses, you know, uh, there are a lot of different points of view, but a, a pretty congenial place where you could, you could be as Jewish or as little Jewish as you wanted without having to worry about harassment or insult. That's not true for Canadian, Canadian, today's Canadian Jewish students. I mean, they are very conscious that campus is an especially hostile place uh, for young Jews, not because they're going to be assaulted, but because they're going to be belittled or diminished and not supported by university communities because Canadian cultural institutions right now are quite defenseless against the kind of harassment and insult that Jews face. Um, I would say I think the Canadian Jews have two main things that the community worries about. Um, uh, the, the first is the permeability of Canadian institutions um, to groups like Hezbollah, to uh, groups like the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, where you have, because Canada is such an open borders country, there's so much migration, um, there are representatives of these groups who arrive in Canada. And because can, the Canadian state tends to be pretty um, uh, slack about internal security, um, that it is people come in who in, in Britain or the United States might have been debarred, their past record of activity might have debarred them. And then in Canada, they then set about creating um, uh, systematically anti-Semitic institutions, and they then penetrate other mainstream institutions, including political parties. Um, which have people in them who really should not be there and whom other parties in other countries have a way of screening out. But the second thing that I think probably preoccupies Canadian Jews the most and is, the, is responsible for the concerns on campus and in other places is um, Canadian elites have committed themselves wholeheartedly to, the, um, to an ideology they've imported from the United States of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, who can be against any of those things? But there's somehow, there are cocktail that when you put diversity, which is good, and equity, which is good, and inclusion, which is good, uh, when you put them all together into one thing, that takes on an ideological component that is at best, um, that, that at best lacks immunity to anti-Semitism and at worst actively incubates anti-Semitism. And, and here's why I, I've thought a little bit about why this is so, what, for why is it so defenseless? Hmm. So the, the diversity is good, equity is good, inclusion is good, put them all together, the ideology together is an ideology of accusation against the mainstream society. So the society is systematically unjust systematically unfair. Rewards are, are, are systematically withheld from those who deserve them and bestowed on those who do not. So when you have a, a cohesive cultural group like the Jews that has succeeded in such societies, there's a suspicion. Well, they must be part of the system of exploitation because otherwise they wouldn't be ahead because there's no such thing as deserved success. Um, uh, effort and work and contribution, that doesn't explain it. Um, so only exploitation succeeds it. So if you have a group that is quite successful, they must be the ultra exploiters. And even if people don't quite articulate that, there's this lingering suspicion and mistrust. And certainly I mean, Jewish concerns are to be disregarded. But here's, but it, but it can be worse than that. They can actively incubate it. Because um, and, and we have seen, I mean, there's a very spectacular example of this where the Canadian gov government paid more than half a million dollars to an agitator who I think no longer even lives in Canada, um, who was notorious. And before he got this huge chunk of money, um, 
uh, got notorious, uh, uh, was notorious for his uh, online and personal abuse of Jewish concerns. Now, the answer is given, this person slipped through the cracks, but I, I don't think that's right. I mean, the question is because the crack, yeah, the person may have slipped through the cracks, but the cracks weren't there by accident. The cracks were designed on purpose. And if this person hadn't slipped through the, those open cracks, someone else would have. Um, because if what you believe um, is that the society you live in is systematically unjust, um, well, maybe you can't do much about the society because it's so wealthy and powerful, but are there other similar societies that are less powerful? And so the state of Israel can become this kind of demon, this demon uh, on which is projected everything you hate about the, about the United States or Canada or Great Britain, but that you can't do much about. But Israel, maybe, maybe you could. Maybe, maybe you could do something about that. And so people who hate Israel then find in this new ideology an entry point into mainstream politics. And because this new ideology is so defenseless against them, it welcomes them. And because it is systematically indifferent to Jewish concerns, it doesn't hear the complaints. And so you get and, um, incidents like this one. Um, and there will be more. Um, and maybe, and, and the ones you worry about more are the ones that are less spectacular. You know, schools, high, people who are a little bit more careful about what they say on social media, but are not more careful about what they do once they're embedded in the institution, who gets hired, who get hired, who are sought out by these institutions. So your job is to do things that we know are going to be hostile to the Jewish community and that are going to diminish Jewish concerns. And that is your job in this institution and will give you power in this institution to do that job. Holy smokes, David, um, there's so much there. Uh, you know, I'd just say in parentheses um, that a, a worldview that uh, sees individuals uh, in categorical terms, you know, that in effect ha replaces uh, in, in the individual with group characteristics, it doesn't strike me as a stretch to think that that's going to attract uh, mm -hmm. racists uh, and, and others uh, who who are inclined to, to think that way. Um, your answer, though, in a way, uh, uh, sort of challenges the next question I was going to put to you, but I'll, I'll put to put it to you anyway because uh, it, it may give you a chance to uh, elaborate. Is um, contemporary anti-Semitism a left-wing problem or a right-wing problem? In your view, what's the main source of today's yeah. anti-Semitism? Well, I think we live in a time in which um, left-wing and right-wing as we've known them, are becoming blurrier and less useful describers. Um, and on issues from Ukraine to trade um, to, um, uh, to anti-Semitism, what we're, what we're finding is you know, uh, that Tony Blair and David Cameron look more and more alike. And the far right and the far left also look more and more alike. And, and at some point, you know, say, well, maybe we just are thinking about this problem wrong. So where does anti-Semitism come from? Come from? So uh, because uh, there, there, there is, Jewish advocates will often describe anti-Semitism as a form of racism because racism is something that we so condemn and they, they are hoping to piggyback or caboose anti-Semitism, which is not so condemned upon racism, which is so condemned. But the truth is anti-Semitism is different. For, it's a special form of racism. It's different from other racism because anti-Semitism anti is first and foremost a conspiracy theory. People who are racist against non-whites, um, are, are tend to be contemptuous, to look down on them, to feel regard them as, as inferiors. Anti-Semites are not contemptuous. Anti-Semites are paranoid. Um, they believe that, that they, they attribute sinister powers to the Jews. Um, they see them as operating more collectively, having being, being endowed with special talents, being involved in a kind of global conspiracy. Hmm. And, and so um, this paranoid outlook, um, this is what drives, attracts people to anti-Semitism. And often people start not being anti-Semitic, that you'll see something where people who are paranoid um, want, need somebody at the center of the conspiracy. And so they may not start off as anti-Semites, but they're drawn toward it because who else fits there? You know, what um, you will hear a, a lot of people who are in the anti-vax world talk about globalists. Well, that seems kind of, kind of vague. Um, or uh, they, so they, they, you need to make it more exciting, more personal. You need to give these globalists a name and a face. And when you do that, they become, they tend to be assimilated to pre-existing ideals of the Jews. Um, so I, I think this, that you need to understand this as a paranoid uh, idea, as a conspiracy theory, as the first uh, 
strongest and most fundamental of all conspiracy theories and the way and the one to which all people who believe in any conspiracy theory are eventually drawn uh, that, that's um again a lot of insight there i would just say for viewers and listeners um interested in some of the things that david has raised um that they might read uh rudyard griffiths the hub's executive director a column from uh the past several weeks uh in which he zeroed in on um the the growing place that the World Economic Forum seems to um, seems to situate for a lot of extremists on both um, the left and the right. Uh, David, I, think, I, I, wish, I, I wish I could sentence some of those people to attend a session of the World Economic Forum. <laughs> all right, all right, let's, let's, let's see you walk the walk. You have to sit through one of those <laughs> panel discussions and then see how you feel. <laughs> Your comments, though, beg the question, um, what should policymakers, public authorities, and those that lead some of these institutions in which anti-Semitism um, can ma manifest itself, what, what should they uh, be doing to address this, uh, what appears to be a growing problem? Yeah, well, let me uh, start by saying something that won't help. That, that one of the things that is often said is that if, if only there was some kind of comprehensive Middle East peace agreement, um, if only Israel were accepted by its neighbors. That that well, I think we're but we're we are right now having a real world test of that hypothesis, which is uh, starting with Egypt and then spreading through Jordan and now to the Gulf and soon Saudi Arabia. Um, Israel is at peace; is becoming at peace with its neighbors, um, and Israel is more accepted, has deeper relationships, um, and the the states that are hostile to Israel, Iran and Pakistan, are not Israel's neighbors, and and indeed have have no real world points of contact with Israel. I mean, it, it exists. And, and I think what this is suggesting is um, anti-Zionism is not a rational response to the conflicts of, of the region. Um, you know, uh, Kashmir is also a contested ground, but you don't have like global fantasies about, about Kashmir in the way that you do um, uh, about, the, about the Middle East. So I think we're gonna see that, um, the peace treaties that are, that are and, what a tremendous achievement it is starting with Egypt and the Camp David process through Jordan and now the, now to the Abrahamic Accords in the Persian in the Persian Gulf and and soon we trust with Saudi Arabia. I, I don't think that's going to make a difference at all um, because the reason um, the reason it, it, it because anti-Semitism is needed. So what will um, what will deal with it? I don't. I think we live in a paranoia. In, the the internet is a paranoia incubating technology. Um, it gives people who want to be paranoid enough scraps of information to make their paranoia seem less ignorant uh, than it is, because you have you always have little. I mean, the World Economic Forum that actually exists. Uh, there is a Klaus Schwab. You can you can look at his picture, um, and sometimes some of the thousands of people who attend that forum every year, multiplied by the number of years, sometimes some of them say some pretty loony things, as happens at panel discussions. Um, so you can you can get the scraps of your paranoia and, and the paranoia draws you toward this first and foundational of all conspiracy theories. Um, so we have we need to accept that one um, it's that, the, that it is something about the paranoia incubating nature of the modern world, not the Middle East, that is the driver. And then what governments can do is deal with. I don't think they can deal with the causes they can deal with the symptoms. Um, and that begins maybe that begins with understanding, you know what. Um, we're rejecting the accusation against our own society that the societies we live in, they're not perfect. And they, they, they have many incidents of unfairnesses and many injustices in their past, and those need to be talked about. But by and large, they give the typical person a better deal than the typical person has ever had anywhere on this planet in the history of the world. And when people flourish in, uh, in the, that's not a proof that that group is exploitive. That is a reminder of what good societies we are operating. And so when we praise diversity, when we praise equity, when we praise inclusion, we are not accepting this ideology of accusation, which makes any successful Jew group, and not just the Jews, other groups have faced this too, a, a target of suspicion. Um, you started, David, by describing how um, the rise of anti-Semitism can manifest itself in spectacular ways, but also subtle ways. Um, for our listeners and viewers who are on the lookout for the former, um, but maybe missing the latter, uh, what should they be doing um, to, to be an, an ally and supporter of, um, of Jews in Canada? 
I, I think uphold, uphold the goodness and rightness of Canadian traditions. Um, retain your faith in the basic fairness of Canadian society. Um, when, um, you know, when you see that somebody has achieved some scientific breakthrough or um, has contributed in some way to the arts or the betterment of the society, um, that, that is something that should make you think well of that person, not worse of that person. Um, and then I think in, in your group, you should, um, in, in, especially in cultural institutions, if people are telling you, we feel pretty uncomfortable here, not unsafe, but uncomfortable, uh, that's worth hearing. You would hear that from anybody else. Um, and uh, so you should hear it from the Jews too. Um, and uh, and if uh, if you're a university administrator, if you run a, an art gallery and you hear that, take take it seriously and don't be frightened and intimidated. And, uh, and ironically, one of the things that happens is um, uh, because there is so much, there is disproportionate Jewish presence in these institutions, um, it's often harder for them to act because um, the Jewish commitment to justice and fairness means that you actually give yourself less of a, a hearing than you otherwise might have. Um, and I, I remember talking once to somebody from the United Arab Emirates, uh, and uh, he said to me, the problem with you Jews, he said, is you are always for the underdog, even when the underdog is trying to kill you. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, that you can also, there's a famous set of questions from a great rabbi of 2000 years ago, the Rabbi Hillel, who said, you know, um, if I am uh, only for myself, what am I? But if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Well, David, uh, this has been a, a fascinating uh, and insightful conversation, as, as they always are. Um, I want to uh, wish the best to you and your family, uh, and I look forward to catching up in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.